Welcome back to World War II TV and the last show before I take a break for a few days. The next uh, show will be in our Masters of the Air series, which will come and kick off on March the 11th. Don Miller, John Orloff, lots of other brilliant guests coming up now. But the recurring theme, as we've just been talking about strategic bombing recently, has been the, the burden on the men who are in those aircraft. See the segue there? See how men are moving you towards today's subject? Anyway, in today's show... Guest Mary Brazier will be look, talking about how what we might call today mental health specialists looked at the stress of flying strategic bombing missions in World War II and how that may influence doctrine and procedures. Um, so I'll bring Mary in now. Good evening, Mary. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks, Woody. So this is an, an expanded version of the presentation you gave at We Have Ways last September for, for Jim and Al in the scorching heat of, of the armory uh, at, at uh, near Silverstone, so um, your f the fan won't blow your notes away this time. You're sitting in your own in your own chair in your own library, so if you can do it there, it should be a breeze here. No pun intended. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. I don't know how many people on the sidebar tonight were were there. We have for ways, but if you weren't there, you just had to be there. It was stifling. So, yeah. so well done to anyone who who was there in the summer. Um, there was there was beer and alcohol though and soft drinks as well, so that, as well as scorching heat in a huge greenhouse at midday um while i talked and talked and talked about this, this subject so, but that's yeah. the thing isn't it? i mean you're 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 world war ii buff you're, you're doing you're, you're studying world war ii but also you are in the mental health healthcare profession so it's it's bringing two areas of interest together and you know you you must um I'll let you bring your presentation up, but you must look at some of the old documentation written decades ago and kind of roll your eyes at the way it was written about back in the day. You know, the understand the basic understanding of you know the the stresses of 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 high level work and stuff. You you must spend a lot of time going, oh my god, we've we've come a long way. Yeah, totally. In some ways, but not completely. I mean, I. I've made references um, in the past and I will do this evening around the use of language mm. and about how we need to be need to think about, you know, this was language from the 30s and 40s and how they talk about people with mental illness is different and it's clunky and it it feels just wrong. Um, but we can't judge them for that. It's just it was different times. But equally, there are things in there that I think oh, hasn't changed much. There was I won't be talking about it tonight. It's not part of. of this issue but in the in the files I've been going through in the archives there's reference to inpatient capacity um mm. so how many beds do you need in what hospitals for what specialisms and I was just having a conversation part of our one of the meetings I was in at work yesterday was around inpatient bed capacity and wards and how we're moving people around and length of stay exactly the same conversations 80 mm. years ago so some things have moved on some things haven't well, we'll find out more, and I'll hand over to you for your presentation. Folks, kind of fire away with questions as we go along. When I mute myself, it's because I'm coughing my guts up because I cannot get rid of this stinking cold I got last week. Thank you, Matt, uh, my mate Matt in Normandy, for giving me that. It's, I'm, I'm, you are a dear friend for passing it on to me and Colin. But, Mary, over to you. Let's look at the role of um, psychology and psychiatry. Thanks, Woody. All right. So, as, as Woody said, I do have a day job. I don't spend all my life... Uh, looking at World War II and I am a mental health social worker and at, at the moment I'm a director of social work in a mental health and community trust so this is my proper day job too. I do the, the Second World War history uh, for fun in my spare time which is what I'm telling myself at the moment when I'm frantically trying to get my dissertation written up before it's due to be handed in in you know, just over two weeks, um, which was why when Woody said, I've got a spot next week, has anyone got time to do anything? I was like, yeah, I've got some spare time. That's fine. I'll do it. Um, I thought it might chivvy me up with writing the dissertation. So that's why I'm here this evening. So it's inevitable, perhaps, that I'm looking to combine the two. Anyone who knows me knows I don't really do the pointy bang bangs. I'm talking about Bomber Command. I can just about tell the difference between a flying fortress and a Lancaster. Anything other than that. So don't expect too much from the pointy bang bang uh, perspective. I am more of a social historian, which as a social worker, you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear. So 
What I wanted to explore was how mental health issues were identified and addressed in RAF Bomber Command, um, largely to kind of contain things a little bit. I've always been interested in mental health and military history. How do I narrow that down into an area that's containable, particularly for the master's degree? I can explore, go down other rabbit holes later, but I need to get this master's done. So for my dissertation, I am looking at the role of psychology and psychiatry in RAF Bomber Command, and specifically RAF, um, because it's easier to do British stuff than it is American and Canadian, because the archives are here. So for no other reason than that, there is lots of interesting stuff around the US Army Air Force. Um, anyone watching Masters of the Air, clearly I'm finding a lot of it fascinating. If you haven't seen the episode from last Friday, there, there's an element of, of mental health um, support and treatment included in terms of the use of flak houses. Love a bit of a flak house um, and would love to get into the, the American Red Cross archives to understand the development of flak houses. And there were quite a few um, not far from where I live or some of the houses that were used. So that's really interesting. And also how on earth do you persuade people to get into a, a ball turret? I have no idea. Um, but that's the Americans and I'm not talking about them. Um, so thinking about the archives and thinking about how much time I've spent going through this stuff um, and getting the slide presentation ready for this evening, I did do loads and loads and loads of photographs of typewritten 1940s manuscripts and thought, actually, that's going to be really dull because you won't be able to read any of it. And I'm only going to be reading to you what's on it. So you're just going to have to believe me that the stuff I'm telling you, I found in the archives, and I'm not just going to give you hundreds of slides of photographs of typewritten paper. Um, so be thankful for that last minute change of mind. Um, but what of what much of what we see written about mental health and war in the 20th century is focused on an emerging understanding of what was to become known as shell shock. We're used to this term shell shock now. We we take it for granted. Um, in the First World War. Um, and there are many First World War tomes with the sh term shell shock in the title. We've got Weldy Hol Wendy Holden shell shock, just as one example, and also the fictional narrative. So I've got, you know, the Pat Barker trilogy that's probably been on my bookshelves for since they were published, which mm. I'm looking at the 1995 <laughs> book of prize, they're nearly 30 years old, which I'm not that old, that can't possibly be true. Um, but it seems that there's less written on mental health in combat in the Second World War, at least feels like it. There was so much about shell shock, um, but less specifically about mental health and responses to combat experiences in the Second World War. We've got more general military psychiatry texts available. I mean, the, the main one that people have heard of is Ben Shepard's War of Nerves. And there's also um, uh, a book written, uh, Shell Shock to PTS, from, from Shell Shock to PTSD by Edgar Jones and Simon Wesley. And when I saw Simon Wesley as a, a co author of that book, I got really excited because again, day job comes into mind. And Simon Wesley is um, uh, Sir Simon Wesley, I should call him, at the Royal College of Psychiatry, um, was actually led the review into uh, our current Mental Health Act a few years ago. So he was very much a big part of what was going on before it was shelved. Don't get excited. There's no new mental health fight coming. The government fucked up on that one. Anyway, um, but the notable exception to this is Mark Wells's 1995 Courage in Air Warfare. Um, and what's, I look at um, something in 1995 and I think, oh, that's relatively recent. Yeah, it's, it's not, is it? Really? It's, not now. Yeah. It's nearly 30 years old. So there's not a lot that's new at the moment. Um, so when I'm looking for examinations on the psychological impact of fighting the bomber war, I really couldn't find much in the secondary literature. So, and even in the James and Wesley's book, um, the reference to, our, to the RAF is pretty much limited to a brief exploration of the process of lack of moral fiber. And I'll come back to lack of moral fibre, but don't get too excited. So what's so interesting? Why do I think that I'm looking at RAF Bomber Command, RAF in particular, but specifically Bomber Command, rather than any other um, uh, field of, of war fighting? And it is 
pretty much because it was new. So mm. we think about it, war has been fought on land and, on, and sea since time immemorial for millennia. Um, so two dimensional war fighting, if you like. So doctrine in both firmly established. People know how to fight wars on floaty boats and things and fire at each other and broadsides and, you know, the three to one attacking advantage and how to form square when you've got cavalry, you know, and all of that malarkey. But how do you fight wars from the air? Um, so John Buckley, got a reference, John Buckley, one of the yep. tutors, got to get him in. Um, so he reminds us of the absence of that um, bomber war doctrine and of the fact that it was a little over 40 years that had passed since the Wright brothers' first flight. This was something that was really new. And I may be pointing out the bleeding obvious here, but I think it is useful to reflect that, that this was so new. They yeah. were making it up as they went along. But not only was fighting wars in the air, in and from the air, new, but psychology and psychiatry were also relatively new as a medical specialism. They were making it up as they went along too. So we've almost got a perfect storm of no one really knew what they were doing. Yeah. So let's, let's put the two together and see what happens. So in terms of making it up as they went along, I want to go back just to the topic of lack of moral fibre, because it was interesting when you, when you announced um, this talk this evening, Woody, I think someone, I'm not sure if they're, they're in the audience at the moment, but said, oh, lack of moral fibre. And that was kind of, that's kind of what happens. If anyone does know anything about this, so you're already talking about a select few, they immediately jump to, oh, you're interested in lack of moral fibre. And to be honest, I'm not particularly. Um, but please have a look. For those of you who know Dan Ellen, I mean, he was on the show a couple of nights ago. I know Dan's done some brilliant work on lack of moral fibre. It's a disciplinary process. It's not a clinical process. They dragged psychiatrists into it, but it was not a clinical process. So I'm, I'll mention it a little bit, but it won't be the focus of this talk and it's not the focus of my work. Um, so what will I talk about then? other than just Len Dayton's bomber. Um, so what I did find out when I, as I said, there isn't a huge amount in the secondary literature. So I then went to the archives, love the archives. Anyone who hasn't been to Q, you need to go to Q. Um, it's amazing. Um, what I found was that there's a huge amount there talking about there was a, a war cabinet subcommittee of psychology and psychiatry across all three services. Um, so the war cabinet minutes don't just refer to the RAF, let alone bomber command. They do refer to the Admiralty and the army as well. Um, but they were very much making use of psychologists and psychiatrists in strategic planning and operational decision making. So um, it's it's really interesting that they're not we're not also talking about 1939 we're talking about back to the mid 1930s when they're almost preparing for what might be coming you know we're, we're not yet at spanish civil war and guernica mm. but there's kind of a there's going to be we've got these bigger planes that we can chuck things out of there's this is going to be part of war fighting so they started to think about what that means um, and also want to think about that we're not just talking about these huge famous raids. We're not just talking about Operation Chastise, the Dams Raid, Dresden, uh, the firebombing Nuremberg. We're not talking about those really famous raids that happened once in a blue moon. We're talking about the day-to-day -day almost drudgery of uh, bombing raids that went on, bombing missions that went on. So I did look at, just to get our heads around, you know, how the, the demands on the crews of the amount of missions that were flown. And anyone who doesn't already have a copy, as I throw loads of books on the floor, have a copy of the Bomber Command War Diaries, um, the late, great Martin Middlebrook, um, highly recommend. It's great bathroom reading, I find, because you can dip in and out of it. Um, 
Oh no, I've got, I've got, I've got nerves now about dropping a book in a bath. That 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 sent me into all sorts of oh, oh. I was the thing of a book getting wet is just. I mean, that's just. It was I a signed one as well. Oh my god. Oh. But anyway, um, but it is something that you can dip in and out of, particularly if you want to look at what's happening around particular dates and across different. Again, the different what's going on in the naval war and the ground war. Um, so there's a report. I looked at September 2020, uh, 1943, because it was it was the, the same week that I gave the talk in Warfest. And the, so the report for the 8th and 9th of September of an attack on Boulogne gun positions. So they deployed 257 aircraft, 119 Wellingtons, 112 Sterlings, 16 Mozzies, 10 Halifaxes and five B-17s. So they let the Americans out to play that day. It was the first of the American night bombing sorties of the war with Bomber Command. Now, no aircraft were lost on this raid, but equally it wasn't successful, didn't achieve anything. The marking of the bombing weren't accurate and the battery wasn't damaged. So 257 aircraft went on a raid that didn't achieve anything. Multiply that, obviously a lot of different aircraft someone who's much better at maths than me could possibly work out how many men we're talking about on one raid that doesn't achieve anything. But then go forward a few days, just to the 14th, the night of the 14th, 15th, September 43, what's referred to as minor ops. Eight Lancasters, 617 Squadron, we may have heard of them before, they set out with the 12,000 pound bomb to attack the Dortmund Ems Canal near Ladbergen. And while the force was over the North Sea, however, weather reconnaissance Mozzie reported that there was fog over the target area and the Lancasters were recalled. And the aircraft of Flight Lieutenant DJH Maltby, one of the original members of the Dambusters squadron, crashed into the sea and all the crew were killed. Maltby's body was washed ashore and is buried at Wickenborough near Canterbury. His crew memorialised at Runnymede. Memorial for the missing. So one night you've got 257 aircraft deployed, no losses. Minor operation a few days later, eight lengths, the loss of an aircraft and her crew crashing into the sea, neither of these raids achieving anything. So let's take a moment just to consider that unpredictability of who gets to come and sleep in their own bed at night. And this is why I'm particular interest. And I, like, I propose that there's a bit of a difference between fighting overseas um in for example the army or on your ship you are in a different environment to being at home in your home country sleeping in your own bed you know barracks or officers mess or otherwise but it's your own country with your own possessions around you you can leave um the station you can go to the pub which missions do you say goodbye for how do you constantly prepare for the impact of being in your own country, your own quarters, your own possessions around you. You never know if this mission will be your last or if you'll be back to sleep in your own bed in a few hours. And I think this is something, again, I'm going to refer back to Masters of the Air. I think this is something that they've captured particularly powerfully in terms of that crew's missing and just the empty beds and what's happening with their possessions and their trunks. So how did Bomber Command and ultimately the Air Ministry assure themselves that they had chosen the right men for these frankly ridiculous tasks. And we are, of course, in this case, talking about men. I'm not going to gender this. We're talking about men. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to a couple of people involved in this work. I'm being terrible with slides. Sorry, Woody. Um, so this chap here is the Air Vice Marshal. Sir Charles Putnam Simmons. Now he's actually a neurologist, but I'm, I'm, I'm forgiving him for that because he was particularly involved in this work. He's in charge of the head injury centre in Oxford. So St Hugh's College, Oxford, is the um, is what's on his note paper. Now his own backstory is really interesting. So he paused his medical studies to enlist in the First World War where he served as a motorcycle dispatch rider, continued his medical studies after being wounded and invalided home, then serving as a medical officer, including to the Royal Flying Corps. Again, this is First World War, clearly. He was commissioned as a group captain at the outbreak of the Second World War, 
By the end, he was an air vice marshal, vice marshal and had been knighted for his work. So that shows you um, his level of commitment and the impact that his work and, and himself had had um, during the war. So why am I, why am I talking about Simmons? He's, he's not a known name. We're not talking Bomber Harris. So why am I a bit of a fan of Charles here? Well, in my work in the archives, when I was looking at these particular files, his name kept coming up. His name's on most of the reports. There's a, nine, there's a post-war 1947 publication entitled Psychological Disorders in Flying Personnel of the RAF, investigated during the war 1939 to 1945. It's a snappy title. It's a compendium of 23 papers written during the war. And Simmons is an author or co-author in the majority of these papers covering topics such as use and abuse of the term flying stress and series of cases with psychological disorder examined in relation to the problem of selection in flying personnel. And despite those titles, they are really enlightening. They are really interesting, honestly. Um, and here we've got Air Marshal Sir Harold Whittingham, the Director General of Medical Services for the RAF. Now, I like these, these photos are in the Imperial War Museum archives. Um, and I'm including both of them because they amuse me. I clearly need to get out more, but they do. Um, so the photo on the left, I like to think of as his LinkedIn profile. It's very yep. Yep. upright, very stern. It's clearly his official photo. And yet in the <laughs> looks like the same um, day, he clearly chose to also take a less formal shot. It makes you Whether, wonder what other uh, images were posed. N now try and change long, uh, sir. Uh, and perhaps yeah. now like, ho hold the curtain lovingly. You, you wonder what other ones were rejected. Yeah, definitely. It makes me smirk. Definitely. Look, into the, look into the camera and just, yeah. So it amuses me. It's there for no other reason than it amuses me. So as I've said, note on language. Um, it's a bit jarring, some of the things that you find. I won't particularly be using those terms, but where we do, it's it's because that's what's in the archives. Yeah. I'm not going to update the language um, because we've got um, different expectations these days. These are terms that meant something um, and weren't offensive at the time. And I think sometimes when we try and update language in order not to offend people, we end up mistranslating and losing some of the the tense. So it's kind of the, not a trigger warning as such, but I will be using terms that um, we wouldn't use today. So the other thing that I'm avoiding, I'm spending a lot of time talking about what I'm not going to do. I'm very mindful of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the temptation as well, and I find this really tricky, especially with my professional hat on, is there's a temptation to apply a post hoc diagnosis to experiences that we're seeing in records or we see in historical documents. Um, personally, I know not all, some historians like doing that and like to try and diagnose things from historical records. Fabulous, you know, leave them to it. That's something I don't like to do because those understandings weren't there. And also conspicuous by its absence is any concept of moral injury. We talk a lot in veterans mental health these days about moral injury, about coping with the impact of what you did when you were serving. Um, again, wasn't a thing at the time. So we may be able to kind of formulate that people are struggling with some kind of moral injury, particularly clearly um, those who'd served in bomber command, but it's not something that was understood at the time. It's only been a very recent addition. And in terms of kind of what was known at the time, we need to set aside our understandings of trauma and PTSD because they really weren't terms and phenomena that were understood at the time. The diagnosis itself wasn't postulated until 1976 when it was initially known as post-Vietnam syndrome specific to veterans who served in Vietnam. The understanding moved swiftly beyond military service to civilian traumatic incidents, and it made its way into the American Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, something called DSM-3, as it was then, that was the edition, in 1980. So that's when it became a recognised diagnosis with diagnostic criteria. Now, the reason that 
I would suggest this is important is because when a diagnosis has diagnostic criteria, when you're doing an assessment, those are the questions you're asking. That's what you're exploring. There wasn't that diagnosis. So when we're looking at clinical notes, clinical records, case summaries, the clinicians aren't asking those questions. Right. So the risk is that you're trying to fill in the gaps. Some things jump out at you. Spaniels are joining in. Um, they find this fascinating, by the way, um, that we try and fill in the gaps and we try and say, oh, they must have been suffering PTSD. It, it's been oh. quite a, a recent thing, is it? It's like the Montgomery. Is Montgomery on the spectrum somewhere? Is he Asperger's? Is he autistic? And, and it, I can find I find it intriguing that there's a possibility we can explain a possibility we can explain some of the uh the characteristics of these people via these diagnoses 80 years later but i also see that it's basically it's just conjecture it's all just the same as when we say well what would have happened if market garden had happened two weeks later we can put a theory out there but we can't we can't test it yeah don't we love a bit of counterfactual yeah yeah but, uh, and I think this is the same. It's counterfactual. It's, well, what if? What if someone had sat down and done an assessment for for um, autism with Monty? What would they have found? We don't know. Yeah. Um, and I certainly wouldn't look to do that. But I think we must talk about, you know, what was understood. As I've said, the, there was a lot of thinking about shell shock um, from the First World War. So there was... I felt a need to myth bust a little bit because, and I'm speaking as someone who did um, English, the war poets, both for GCSE and A-level, not sure how that happened. It was a little bit interminable, um, as well as GCSE history and A-level uh, um, A history, battlefield tours, English, everything was about um, shell shock and perhaps the lions led by donkeys myth was still very prevalent and that people experiencing shell shock um, were treated really poorly. Again, bit of a myth. They weren't necessarily treated as cowards. And it's very personal to me too. My maternal grandfather um, was discharged from the London Scottish with shell shock after his trench was shelled at Vimy Ridge. Again, not a huge, not kind of the Canadian Vimy Ridge that we all know about, just a day when a shell landed and was family law says he was the sole survivor and his his um records which i accessed relatively recently after both my mum and my uncles had, had died um uh, supported that um so his this is an n equals one study so it's purely anecdotal but his service record says nothing but positive things about his conduct so he's um he was discharged honorably from a psychiatric hospital in nottingham and went back to being um a banker mm. um, and was was a bank manager for the the westminster bank in bishop stortford during the second world war um but the the understanding of the condition needed to evolve rapidly and the term itself so we use the term shell shock and we understand that it's a more general issue it's not just um about uh, people who have been in trenches and shelled, but that is exactly what it was to start with. And there was something about this person seems to be experiencing shell shock, but they haven't been shelled. How can they be experiencing shell shock? Apologies for the barking. I'm not sure what's going on, but there's a lot of spaniels in the house at the moment. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too bad. Um, do you want to let them in or out? Or they're in the they're in the kitchen. They're clearly keeping out an invasion of burglars. Right, um, right. So don't worry. They no. are. They're not coming to any harm. They're just being annoying because they're spaniels. Yeah. So, the the term shell shock was originally a very Ron Seal term. It was signifying in the popular mind that the patient had been exposed to and suffered from the physical effects of the explosion of projectiles. Love that. Um, and you can't get much more specific than that. So from that literal definition, the understanding of the fact has evolved. But by that time, the term had stuck. So there was an understanding that this isn't just about people in trenches who've been shelled. It's about um, a wider um, ex wartime experience. 
So we see official documents seeking to stop saying shell shock as it could be misleading. And they try to in, in, introduce the term war neuroses. Mm. Um, but these documents um, are saying, we won't use the term shell shock, it could be misleading because they weren't shelled. But immediately after saying, but everyone knows what we mean. So after that, all uses of the term in official documents seem to be in, I think, somewhat resigned quotation marks. So you see, you do see shell shock, but we mean war neuroses. Right. So it fails miserably to stop using the term. And it's the same with the Royal Flying Corps. Latterly, of course, the RAF, um, where one clinician reported psychological disorders in 10% of 600 pilots in his squadron between 14 18, some of them flying and some flying in combat. And they were kind of saying, but how could they have shell shock? Because they were up in, they were flying. It's, it's, I find it really interesting when you kind of want to point out the bleeding obvious to them, mm. but it wasn't obvious. And I think that's something that is worth uh, repeating. So when a psychologist getting involved in the work of the RAF, and what are the reasons for their involvement? Well, initially, at least, well-being of pilots, you might be surprised to hear, was not the motivating factor. Um, so what we're seeing is the need to get the most efficient use of the most valuable resource. So that's the air crew. Right. That's not to say there isn't any benevolent motivation. An absent, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. But if it's not there at an individual level, um, if it's there, it's at an individual level, not a strategic one. And it's mentioned rarely, if at all. But I think it's it's also worth saying that I'm looking at official documents here and I'm not expecting official documents to be fluffy and to mm. be talking about that they're there, we need to look after these men. They will be talking very strictly about efficient use of resources. So we shouldn't assume that just because it isn't mentioned in the reports doesn't mean that those involved in writing them weren't thinking about what was in the best interests of these men. It just means that it's not reflected in the documents. So I don't want to make any assumptions there. But one of the things that psychologists first get involved with is looking at fatigue. They weren't actually looking at mental health and mental well-being. They were looking at how do we get these men to do this thing that we think might be quite tricky and we've never done it before. Mm. So how do we get people to sit in these aircraft and fly over to the continent? Because they kind of knew that that's what we'd be asking them to do. Um, so there's a lot of liaison between colleagues in the air ministry and a, a Cambridge academic so we've got a Professor McCurdy here um, and letters to and from Professor McCurdy. And I love these. I haven't included them all, as I said, because we don't want to spend hours um, looking at typewritten 1930. This is 1930s stuff. Um, but it's back and forth memos and letters uh, between the Air Ministry and this Professor McCurdy. And they want to send um, Air Commodore Richardson and Wing Commander Burton to go and have a chat with him about fatigue. So Professor McCurdy, a psychologist um, at Cambridge at Corpus Christi, is doing work on fatigue and we want to understand about how that's going to impact um, our crews in the bombers. So they, they also then were looking, that's, this is Professor McCurdy writing back, sorry I did include some of this because I think it's so twee. He can't um, be a medical professional, he's got far too good handwriting. Can you read it? God, it takes me forever. Well, I mean, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, it, I've seen worse. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's a psychologist, though, not a doctor. Um, okay, that's the excuse. So, okay. Distinctive. You said that with a with a note of expertise there. Yeah, I've worked with them for 25 years, love them. Um, but the, so there is, it's, it's all the very twee stuff that I find really interesting about, we'll come for tea and if you come this time, you'll get this train and we'll come and pick you up and come and have some tea. Um, but they're talking about fatigue. So they're including um, academics in this work, talking about um, comparisons of various aircraft, moving on to an exploration of other causes of fatigue. So they're looking at oxygen in the aircraft, they're looking at comfort, um, they're looking at the weight of the um, uh, the the aircraft to fly, um, and they're using objective and subjective um, psychological tests. So, 
the subjective psychological test is they're coming back from from these test flights and they're having interviews to test out to ask them how tired they are to get their view on what they've experienced and then objective tests which is you give them a task to do that's measurable so not only oh I'm fine I'm not tired at all you give them um, a test to do and it demonstrates that actually they are tired they have performed differently than they did beforehand so an objective measure of their ability to concentrate. So one of these is pages and pages of random letters with the men tasked to find um, certain letters in those pages and objective measure of their ability to concentrate. So again, measure really good. Psychologists are really good at standardised testing. And this is what was evolving here um, and being applied. And the other um, aspect here is around um, crew selection. So this, this weird thing that we think we're going to be asking people to do, how do we make sure that we're selecting the right people? So it's really important. There's, and again, going back to there being very little, if any, understanding of the impact of negative experiences on people's mental state and mental health. Instead, what there was, was very much an assumption that responses to experiences are largely influenced by pre-existing personality traits. So you're predisposed to not coping. Right. So that assumption is there. So psychiatry, a really relatively recent medical specialism, very Freudian stuff is still very much there. It's all about, did your mother love you? Um, were you locked in a cupboard? All of that stuff. Is there a family history of mental illness? Um, so the assumption <laughs> goes the door. Great. Um, I was just thinking it was all too good to be true. And then World War Three kicked off. I gave them special long lasting treats and everything, but they're keeping the burglars out still. So instead, there was an assumption that responses to experiences, as we said, largely influenced by pre existing personality traits. If you get the selection right, if you choose the right people, they'll be fine. They'll cope with whatever you throw at them. And one clinician, um, squadron leader Reed, um, proposed a hypothesis. So what one of the things they found was that slightly older men, this is all relative, so we're talking mid-20s, not late teens. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Dan. Um, and what they were finding was that these slightly older men who were uh, more likely to be married, possibly have children, have dependents, um, were reporting higher degrees of stress, of what was becoming termed as flying stress. Now, this squadron leader, Reed, who I believe to be Scottish, and we'll find out why later, um, proposed a, a really interesting hypothesis. And I am making no comment on this other than reporting what he says in, in one of his um, recommendations, one of his observations, which is that the constitutionally neurotic were more likely to have been inveigled into the haven of matrimony. So it's not that people who are slightly older, who have responsibilities, who maybe haven't got um, the, uh, I don't know, the gung-ho attitude of a teenager, they're not immortal, They've got more of a sense um, that they've got something to lose and they have dependents who need them. Um, instead, no, it's because they're, they're neurotic to start with. That's why they got married. That's why they were forced into marriage by these women who trapped them. So when I first saw that comment, I immediately thought, oh, well, you know, I've got my views of squadron leader Reed, who's a medical officer. Um, and... I've made references to it in other talks and I, I tweeted it and I said, you know, this is the standard of psychological understanding um, at the time. Do you mind if I close my door? Yeah, let's, let's try it. Yeah, let's see what it does. You can't make it worse at the moment right now. Yeah. <laughs> it was all too good to be true. <laughs> they'll, they'll build a Trojan horse or something or dig, dig a tunnel. Yeah, there might be something going on at the village hall, the doorbell. I don't know. We're being invaded. Something's going on. So 
what I found is, and this is purely by chance, it was actually on a different visit to the archives that I thought, saw Squadron Leader Reed popping up, bless him. And this is in the comment, in the context of um, uh, a number of, it was just memos back and forth. So we're looking at the 1930s equivalent of a WhatsApp um, uh, 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 exchange, which is that um, my comment on the effect of marriage was not meant to be taken seriously. With your knowledge of the native population, perhaps you could explain to Professor Burt the arid nature of what passes in Scotland for humour. So squadron leader Reed, who because of that I assume to be a Scot, um, was trying to say, I didn't mean what I said in that official report two years ago, you know, don't, I was joking. You think, really? Were you? Or have you just had the piss taken out of you since you wrote it? And now you're trying to say, I was joking. But again, it's um, leaving aside trying to make light of it. It's also a reminder to triangulate what we find in the archives. Don't just find one reference and say, well, this definitely happened. You know, read around it. Because um, there's really a um, there's a temptation to extrapolate too much without further supporting evidence. Um, and it was really interesting that then other people are talking about him. So again, we've got the other 19, this is 1940s equivalent of a WhatsApp um, exchange that didn't include Squadron Leader Reed. And apparently he was a little inclined to read rather more than I should into coefficients based on a short series of observations and sometimes to pass more readily from evidence of associations to causation. So basically this is other academic colleagues telling him he wasn't talking about him and saying he jumped to conclusions. But clearly he was also doing the correlation, not causation thing. So these, again, this is a real academic study they're not necessarily in this thinking from an RAF perspective. They're academics and clinicians looking to research. But just returning to this issue of predisposition, that if you find the right people, they'll, they'll deliver the job. So this, I mentioned earlier, these papers that, that Charles Simmons was involved in. And there were, uh, so this is 100 cases, he wrote this paper summarising, um, examined in relation to the problems of selection of flying personnel. So caveat here, he is including fighter command, but we'll let him off um, for these purposes. So in each case, he considers, considers a number of factors. You've got age, rank. Of the 100, uh, 55 were commissioned, 45 were non-commissioned. I'm not going to introduce um, class here as an issue, but there's, it is um, interesting. Um, uh, we know that officers are different and special, and it has been suggested elsewhere that it was easier to be awarded the DFC than the DFM, um, which is what the non-commissioned officers had as an equivalent until I think the 1990s. I don't know if Dan knows, I know he's in the, I'm not sure when the, the DFM was got rid of and everyone gets the DFC now, but it was for a long-standing reason. You couldn't get the DFC if you weren't an officer. Um, he also looked at the category in the crew. We're talking pilots, observers, uh, wireless operator, air gunners or air gunners, um, what duties they've been involved with. So of the 65 men who'd been operational, 36 were in bombers, 18 fighters. So twice as many people of these, twice as many of these case studies were from bombers. Is that um, a higher rate of prevalence? Possibly difficult to say how he chose the 100 cases. And he also looked at the number of flying hours. So those are the criteria he's looking at in these 100 cases. No reference to family history of mental illness in that criteria. And yet in each case study, we see a reference to predisposition. So we're back to um, the starting point of predisposition being key. So I'm just going to read through a, a couple of these cases. So case 88. So this is Sergeant M, DFM. So he's he's had the, been awarded the DFM. He's a pilot. He's age 21. I find it just shocking to think 21. It's so young. Um, 400 flying hours, 
13 sorties in night bombers on the last trip in mid-November was shot down into the sea and was 16 hours with the rest of the crew in a dinghy, was awarded the DFM as captain of aircraft on this trip. Afterwards, visualised the episode repeatedly and could not sleep. But in two and a half months, he recovered and passed fit full flying duties. The only suggestion of predisposition was the story that one of his brothers had been nervous after an accident. Comment, predisposition was considered nil, flying stress severe. Case 20, um, 29, flight lieutenant, C, pilot, age 24, flying hours 590, operational hours 270 in fighters. During the Battle of Britain, claimed four enemy aircraft, was subsequently on defiance, in which he was never quite happy and had five crash landings, but without injury to himself. After this, he was knocked over by the blast of a bomb during an attack on his airfield, sustained a bruise on his forehead and was momentarily unconscious. After this, he became nervous, depressed, restless and irritable and completely lost his confidence for flying. He failed to recover it after four months rest from flying duties. A paternal uncle had periodic mental breakdowns with recovery. There was no other abnormality in the family history, nor any abnormality in his own life history. So again, it's, he went through all that. He crash landed five times. He was knocked unconscious when his airfield was bombed. And you look at an uncle and his family history and his predisposition, which now, and, and again, speaking with my professional hat on, I look yeah, back and yeah, think, yeah. let's let's look at what happened. Let's not look, look at everything except the bloody obvious of exactly what he's going through on a day-to-day -day basis. No, it's probably his childhood. It's probably, you know, yeah. his mum gave him asparagus when he was three or whatever, you know, just bizarre. <laughs> Yeah, and the comment on this case is, although the story of his uncle's illness taken together with his own was suggestive of an inherited liability, the rule taken for purposes of the present analysis has been not to include mental disorder in second degree relatives, so it's an uncle, not a parent, um, unless supported by other evidence of predisposition. Predisposition, therefore, was considered to be absent. Flying stress was rated as moderate, but the addition of the bombing made the total stress severe. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? So what Simmons goes on to say is of the 24 individuals assessed as showing severe predisposition. So these are people that he's determined either have family history um, of uh, their own parents or had um, some pre-existing issues themselves. So what would happen if they hadn't been selected? Should we have weeded them out? What did we do wrong? You know, what was the impact of not weeding out these predisposed um, men? So he actually said, would the service have gained or lost? It would have gained by saving training 16 individuals with a total of 7,420 flying hours, who proved incapable of making any contribution to the operational effort. It would have lost by the rejection of eight who had contributed as follows. So these eight cases, they are, one of them uh, was in coastal command, 300 flying hours, 109 destroyed, no likelihood of return to operational flying. And he goes through all of them. There's another one, is a, uh, a pilot in night bombers, 28 sorties, five from Britain, five from the Middle East. There's a prospect of return to operational flying duties. So these contributions have to be discounted by the mm. adverse effect upon the morale of others of psychological breakdown especially if it occurs before the end of an operational tour. So we don't want his contagion. He's almost kind of predicting that if people aren't coping, there's going to be a contagion. If, if other uh, uh, crew members see people breaking down, unable to fly, it's going to, there's going to be a knock-on effect. So it would therefore seem possible that rejection of these individuals might have shown a balance on the profit side of the account. On the debit side, we have to allow for the possibility that other personnel still engaged on operational flying would have shown a similar predisposition and would therefore, by the same criteria, have been rejected. Further research must determine this question. Mm. 
so it's it's really different which is why it's so important to look at this through 1940 eyes yeah. not through 21st century good, eyes good question we've got plenty of questions that are building up for you for later on mary but one for me right now any member of an air crew whether they're part of a bomber crew whether they're a fighter pilot whether, if they are in any way a part of a study like or correspondence between professionals are they could that occur without their knowledge or is everything being done with the uh, the agreement of of, a, of the um the person being discussed i don't know that is an excellent question um and because it's an excellent question i don't know because i mean um, like, you know it's perfectly they okay within the military they're anonymized for but, commanders to discuss the you know the the ability of their their non-coms in an infantry unit you know look at smith he's very very good at using a bazooka but he's a good that's standard standard understanding of your unit but and I, and I wonder at what point this might be considered to be to be an invasion of privacy i mean to to, to some to some level i mean and it may even be possible now i i wouldn't know how you'd go around trying i suppose dan would be the best person to ask that yeah. but the the details the case study details are so specific it would probably be possible to identify who's being talked about in terms of the number of flying hours, the number of sorties, the aircraft they were flying, the, you know, what had happened to them. Um, you know, the, the chap who's flying um, Defiance, who's um, airfield, you know, 590 flying hours, he's 24 years old, he's a flight lieutenant. How many? It's probably possible to identify who they're talking about. And when we've got the the uh, sergeant pilot with the DFM, 21-year-old, shot down into, into the sea in a dinghy. It's probably possible to identify who that is. Yeah. So, and individuals themselves, if that, you know, our dinghy chap there um, with the lack of predisposition or, no, his brother had been nervous after an accident. Um, so, so if he then read this paper post-war, he would know that that was him. Mm. It, it's obvious unless they're changing details these days when we're writing about um we're including patients we make sure that the they're anonymized or you change some of the details in the case study so that they're not recognizable i doubt that that was the case then yeah no i doubt no i just it just it got it got me thinking that's all but um amazing mm -hmm. stuff so back to you <laughs> Back to me and the Spaniels. That, yes. Yeah, well, they've been a, the entire subject of a, of a separate conversation in the sidebar there. But um, the, the information is yeah, fantastic. Right. Anyway. They're safe. It's okay. I will have a stern word with them later. Um, so just I want to think about, oh, this, just the, the slide that we've got here at the moment. Again, I've included it because it amused me. Um, so when I was looking at... Um, some of the, the 1930s um, research into the noise of aircraft. There was a lot of assumption that if you're flying a noisy aircraft, it's going to be more fatiguing, which, again, probably true, which wasn't, is it the Challenger tank more recently that is too noisy to, to drive or something? Again, do you drive tanks or steer tanks? I don't know. Don't do pointy bang bangs. But there's something about understanding that if you're in something that's really noisy, it's it's difficult to cope with. So they were looking at the noise of aircraft. And I found this, this um, memo from group captain. I haven't been able to decipher his name, Bone, possibly. Um, but the group captain, who's the air attaché at the embassy in Paris, who hears on authority, which is not absolutely reliable. So he's heard a whisper in a bar or something um, over cocktails, that the outstanding feature of the recent night flying exercises at Metz was the facility with which certain aircraft, which had been fitted with special silencers, eluded detection. So if they're not noisy, you can't know they're there in the dark. Mm. It's kind of, I read that, it amused me. I'm easily amused. Do probably need to get out more. Um, so this is the main file um, that I have returned to on numerous occasions. It's, if, if anyone hasn't been... Um, to the National Archives at Kew. Um, I don't know if this has been your experience, Woody, but you you don't know what you're going to get until you go to your locker and you op open it up. Is it don't one page or is it five boxes? Yep. Yeah. Yes, because I you order a number, you order your files beforehand. You can order them when you're there, but it's you um, 
you largely order them before you go um, and you don't know what you're going to find and some files you that look from their titles really interesting and going to be the absolute nugget that you need it's like one piece of paper that's completely irrelevant and about something completely different and then this folder um which i can't remember how, what it was um titled in when i was searching in the archives but this is this is what it's called it's this huge fat folder of the most random selection of bits of paper you can imagine um, and just in titles, just as you see, the handwritten on the front, flying stress, 41 to 46. And that's where I've got so much of, of my um, work from. It's about this thick and it takes forever to go through. Um, and this is one of the things that was in here. So they were looking at the rate of incidence looking at sorry we've got bigger spaniel bigger noisier spaniel just outside the door now so we're looking at the the prevalence rate and the when we're talking about incidents here man years i'm not quite sure how they work out the man years of the incidence rates but incidence means how often does it happen how often are we seeing flying stress in people in the in the different uh crew positions and and as you can see, the highest rate here is for the air gunners. Now, I'm whilst there isn't a huge amount of analysis as to why, um, I've sort of hypothesized some um, options as to why, because you're looking at the wireless operator air gunner having a much lower incidence than the air gunner, because the wireless operator's got something else to do, not just sit there yeah. with a finger. Yeah waiting to die um Concentrated all the time permanently yeah yeah and again i'm going to link across to what i've been really impressed by masters of the air and how they've demonstrated some of this that you know the the other crew members have got something to do the navigator's busy all the time the pilot's busy slightly higher rate of stress than the navigator but they've got the additional responsibility of for the crew and keeping the aircraft in the air but the air gunner to be high now i would hypothesize that's because other than when they're watching out for the enemy fighters they've got not a lot to do other than ponder your own mortality um and also you're for many of these aircraft the enemy fighters know where the air gunners are sighted and they the pilots are a, a target because if you, if you get the people who are flying the plane, the plane's going to go down. But and you're going to aim for where the, the guns are on each individual aircraft. So particularly risky. You know you're a target and you've got not a lot else to think about. So that's my hypothesis anyway. Um, now, I want to think about the lack of moral fibre. So LMF, the thing I said wasn't going to talk about too much. So... There was actually, I'd, I'd suggest, an inherent conflict between the air ministry looking for a simple dichotomy. They want to know, are these men mad or are they cowards? Um, the psychiatric profession, less keen on simple dichotomies. Psychiatrists love grey areas. Um, and they're also less keen to be the determining factor in a disciplinary process. So what the air ministry was wanting is, well, we want psychiatrists to tell us if this person is mad. If they're not mad then they're cowards and then they go through um, this disciplinary process that was pretty horrendous and very, um, very shameful and intended to be. Um, but the psychiatrists um, not really wanting to be part of that and making a point of saying just because someone may be unfit temporarily or otherwise for flying duties doesn't mean they're perfectly capable of doing other things, other very mm. valuable things and can be deployed. Um, very usefully elsewhere it's not just a can they fly can they not fly are they mad are they cowards should they be in hospital so that the air ministry all throughout was looking for that simple dichotomy but it didn't exist and the, the clinicians were reluctant to be the determining factor in that um, and that's as much as I'm going to say about lack of moral fiber <laughs> as I said look for look for damn stuff it's it's really um, it's really insightful now, the other thing that I was interested in was the number of missions, the maximum number of missions 
Um, it's a thing that's mentioned in Masters of the Air, so it wasn't just the RAF, it was also, also the US Army Aircraft, Air Force who were seeking to, to put a limit on the number of missions. You know, it's a major factor in, in Memphis Bell in terms of this is the aircraft that's done their maximum. Um, and I've, it also comes up in, in films as well. So before Dirk Bogart was 90% successful as Boy Browning, he also played a wing commander in Lan of Lancaster's near the end of his third tour. And he's grounded before he makes it to a round number of 90 ops, which is the magic number for him. And as I said, it's um, as a narrative of a limitation to a tour. But what this prompted for me was, well, who decides how many tours is enough? How many yeah. tours is, that's it. Now you need a break. Now you're done. Um, and it, it was actually quite a complex um, conversation. Should there be a limit at all? Some people said there shouldn't be a limit. Just keep going. And we know that's what the Luftwaffe did. You know, there was no suggestion that there was a limit on, on tours for the German Air Force. Um, just give them enough amphetamines and keep them going. Um, and if there was a limit, would there be benefits and disbenefits? So one squadron commander talks about how his station didn't need a limit as morale was good. So he didn't need something to, to improve morale. Right. Um, but I kind of got the impression it was a kind of a the beatings will continue until morale improves sort of. We don't need to do that. We're fine here. But also demonstrates that for many, the priority remained operational efficiency. So keep the men flying. But there was some discussion about if we do have a limit and there was a general consensus about limit that um, station commander was a bit of an outlier. And it was, well, do we do it by the number of flying hours, the number of missions? How do we measure it? Um, so that was something I looked at particularly. This letter um, I've included because um, it's Clement Attlee writing to Ernest Bevan, which I found, I always find it quite powerful to actually touch the thing. I got really excited when I saw my first um, Arthur Harris signature. I took a picture of it and sent it to a friend and go, oh, I found a Harris. Um, and this is Clem Attlee. And it's my to my dear Ernest, yours ever, Clem, which I just found quite, quite cute. Um, the reason it's relevant here, other than the fact that I find it quite sweet, is that they were talking about the work of this um, uh, sub war cabinet subcommittee continuing after the war and how it could be applied in civilian life, how the learning could be applied. And there was actually quite a lot of res resistance to it. They wanted to draw a line under and move on. Whereas all these academics who've had their work funded for the last six years, if not longer, would say, oh, we want to continue. We think it's applicable in other con in other civilian contexts. We want to keep the keep going. And the government are kind of going, no, 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 I've been there, done that. You know, we've, we've moved on. Um, now, I've, as I said, focused on bomber command, but there is also some interesting things um, coming through for the army, for heaven's sake, because this subcommittee was um, all three services. And one of the things that they found, they wanted to have an understanding of the psychological effect of being attacked by different weapons. Um, I'm not sure why, possibly because it also, if we understand how our troops experience being attacked by different weapons, we'll know what weapons to use against the enemy. I think that was why. Um, and what they found was that the weapons most disliked were the least lethal, which seems paradoxical. Um, so you can suggest a number of reasons for that, but I think there's kind of an obvious one, which is if you've been attacked by a lethal weapon, you're probably dead because it's lethal. Right, so yeah. the ones who've survived who are answering the questions are those who've been attacked by non-lethal weapons, I think. There's also another factor, and one of the things that they did reflect on was because when they were asked, when they were interviewing and asking people, what are you most scared of? It was the officers answering, asking the questions. And they did reflect that, well, maybe people weren't honest. Maybe if we get next time we do it, we'll get the NCOs to ask the questions. They might be more honest with them. Maybe they just people just lie, make stuff up when it, the officers will tell the officers what they want to hear. Um, I don't know if Norma's here tonight. Is she here? She's there. She's in the sidebar, I think. Yep. 
because I always have to mention Canada. Norman will kill me off if I don't mention the Canadians because they're the forgotten nation. Yay, yay, Norma. <laughs> so um, was there a difference between a holy volunteer service and whilst Bomber Command was a holy volunteer service, the Canadian forces as a whole are a holy volunteer service if they're going to be deployed overseas. And how the British worked with the Canadians was in an incredibly collaborative way. Um, and what the, Cana the Canadians did some work on finding out with, with nurses, female nurses, um, how do we make sure they're not going to go mad? So at what age should we recruit nurses? Now there is, I mean, still today, we recognize that there are certain um, ages by which it's likely that if you are predisposed to mental illness, you're likely to have developed one. So there's this whole conversation about, well, we'll only take the older nurses um, because if they're going to develop a mental illness, they'd have got one by now. Women tend to develop um, serious mental illness slightly later than men. Men tend to develop kind of mid late teens if they're going to for instance have a psychotic illness women tend to be late teens early 20s so the the emergence of the same diagnosis is different across the two genders but there was a, a discussion at length about that and and as a result where to set the minimum age of recruitment and then is this applicable um, to other services as well um, what's also important to recognize is that they weren't just thinking about service um, related illness in a conscripted um, force like the British um, services um, you're also looking at the general population so if the incidence of particular illnesses schizophrenia for example is about one percent of the population the same as bipolar disorder prevalence is about one percent of the population you can assume that about 1% of the recruits are likely to, to develop or have schizophrenia, ditto for, for um, bipolar disorder um, or manic depression as it, it used to be known, may have been known then. So there's something about how do we filter that out? How do we manage people who have serious mental illnesses and would have had them anyway? How do we um, weed them out with recruitment? So it's not just positive selection for really difficult roles. It's also about weeding people out who may develop serious mental illnesses and need psychiatric care, which they would have needed in civilian life. Um, so, as I said before, I think one of the things that's notable from the archives is there isn't much consideration of the individual well-being. Um, it is much more about... Um, efficiency effectiveness strategic policy making and again as as i think i said at the beginning that isn't to say it wasn't there it's just not reflected in the official notes um now one of the things that came up and i haven't put a slide on this one but lord moran um charles moran who um wikipedia i you know, the online um, Bodleian uh, referred to him as Churchill's personal doctor. And one of the um, pieces of paper in this, the, the file I, sh I showed you earlier, is, they're just cuttings from the newspaper. Someone took these cuttings out of the newspaper and stuck them in this file. And he'd, he'd written a, a book called The Anatomy of Courage. And he says, the first signs of strain are nowhere more faithfully observed than in the RAF today. Officers in command of stations while still in their 20s are already old with experience. They know that the earlier a pilot's plight is detected, the better chance that he will eventually fly again as a fighting pilot. He should show no sign of fatigue when the time comes for him to be rested. He should grumble when he is not allowed to fly. They taught me that when a pilot's behaviour on the ground changes, when a lad has been the life and soul of the mess, becomes silent and morose, when he loses interest and zest and becomes critical and bad tempered, then it is too late to save him. And a further article he wrote entitled How Courage is Spent makes reference to, amongst other things, more pilots break in bomber command than in any other section of the Air Force. Wow. But returning to that observation about being too late to save him, that takes us back to how do we know when enough is enough? How yeah. many operations? missions should someone be expected to complete 
So that existence of a limit, again, something we take for granted now was very new. And that that's very evocative writing, um, very powerful, very emotive. So quite a contrast to everything else that we find in the archives. What I wanted to, to finish with, if that's OK, is thinking a little bit about what happened after the war. So what the experiences of Bomber Command veterans post-war and why I would suggest it's a little bit different to those from other services, um, even Fighter Command, so even um, other RAF commands. The lack of memorialization and public recognition was particularly compounding the challenge of reconciling their experiences with a problematic why. We did these horrendous things and now everyone wants to forget it. Now everyone wants to pretend we didn't do the thing. We, we could have died every night. We lost friends, we lost comrades. We did these, you know, we were put through this horrendous strain and for why. So most of you are familiar with the story of the Bomber Command Memorial in London at Green Park, or rather lack of, um, until through public fundraising efforts not unveiled until 2012. Um, that's how long it took to get a Bomber Command Memorial in London. And after I gave a version of this talk at, at We Have Ways Fest last summer, as, as we said earlier, um, I was actually humbled by a few people who came up to me afterwards and shared their family stories, um, stories of alcoholism, suicide, for example. Um, now, I'm not saying that these things didn't happen um, for people who'd served in other theatres, but it, I found it... Um, I was particularly humbled by the fact that people chose to seek me out because anyone who's been to We Have Ways Fest knows how many people are there. It's a huge festival. Um, came up to me afterwards and wanted to talk to me and share with me their, their family stories and particularly about how difficult and unthanked um, their, their relatives felt. Um, we know um, Bomber Harris, for example, um, took the blame a little bit. Um, for something that in some ways was perceived to be shameful. It was a bit of the war we didn't want to talk about. Mm. So there's a stark just juxtaposition between the image of Bomber Command portrayed in the Dambusters, for example. Um, and I know that I just have to say Dambusters and 90% of the people in that sidebar have got the theme tune in playing in their heads already. And the experience of those who served in, into civilian life and this letter here, it's from the, the International Bomber Command Centre, the IBCC archive, um, which is all online. Again, have a look. It's a fantastic yep, course. Awesome. If you haven't been um, to the, the centre in Lincoln, go. But the online resource you know, is accessible to all. And this is a letter from Ted Neal. Now, he was a sergeant navigator. And it's in the archive with a bundle of his logs. And I'm, I think families... Um, I'm assuming, uh, donate sort of various resources um, and that's a bundle of his, his navigation logs, his medals and letters to him from his family. But this is a letter I think he wrote um, to someone post war. I'm not sure if it's even he wrote it himself. Um, the context isn't explained, but it's clearly written post war when he's being asked about his experiences. And luckily it's transcribed. So I'm just going to, to say what this, this is just one page of the letter. It's a longer letter. Um, but just the, the, this, these opening phrases, which is maybe you've left it rather late, or it may be that you've got it just right. On returning to Civvy Street, we felt isolated and diminished. After a tour of operations, I returned to my civilian job to continue and finish a tool making apprenticeship at 24 with a wife and child. As I returned, those that stayed in their reserved occupations were leaving to do their national service. You were no heroes. I'd been a warrant officer. Promotion came from still being alive. Alongside me was an ex-flight lieutenant, DFC. He was a labourer sweeping the floor of a machine shop with lots of exc exclamation marks afterwards. So much for Brill Cream boys. I felt isolated. And he goes on in, in, a, in a similar way. So very much, and I'm, the, the letter itself isn't dated. I don't know if there's a way to find out when this was written. Yeah. But what, what comes across to me is, is almost a bitterness of, you know, 
people who were in reserved occupations, they're going off and doing their national service. We did this. The fact that he's saying promotion came from still being alive just shows how many people he who um, lost their lives along the way, I think. If he's saying, well, I only got promoted because I was one of the last ones standing. That's kind of how I read it. And then a, a flight lieutenant with a DFC sweeping a floor. It's, it's incredibly evocative, isn't it? Um, so this is the Bomber Command Memorial. Again, it's I find it a really powerful memorial. Yeah. Not the best photograph. It's the best I could find. It's not one I've taken myself, although I do have plenty. Um, I do find it a really evocative memorial, partly because you know that it's so recent and it's only there because there was a public um, fundraising initiative um, yeah. to do it. And this is the Bomber Command um, Memorial at Lincoln. And you can't see it from that angle, um, but you can see Lincoln, Lincoln Cathedral. Um, so for those uh, in, based at bomber stations in Lincolnshire, Lincoln Cathedral being that the sign that they were nearly home. Yeah. And it is an incredibly, again, incredibly powerful memorial. Um, and the the one next to it, again, it's at the front of the IBCC and it um, commemorates the hunger winter and the role of Bomber Command in supporting Dutch civilians during the hunger winter. Incredibly powerful. And again, I haven't got to put a photo of it here, but the memorial outside the um, American hangar at Duxford. Yeah. Just the numbers of crews and it is, it's incredibly powerful. It, it does the job. It does what it's intended to do, which is just show exactly how many people we're talking about here. So I just want to, again, found something that amuses me a little. And this is, please remember what I said at the beginning about use of language. So towards the end of the war, um, they were starting to have conversations about what was going to happen at demobilization. And they, they learned how to you know, understand um, the, the kind of, of men who were coming through for service. So you've got that they were started to plan the national service pro, um, program that they already knew was going to be implemented post-war. So we've got a vastly slimmed down RAF, a Navy that's no longer wavy, and questions as to what to do with those less able man, men called up for national service. So this expert committee who've done all this work um, and, you know, there's a high degree of sophistication here, said, and I quote, there's no other option but for the dull and the backward to go into the army. So on that note, wow. were there any other questions? Oh, there are questions, Mary. Um, and some <laughs> of them you will be able to answer and some of them you'll, it'll probably just send you down another rabbit hole of research because... Um, because they're that kind of questions, but I'm um, amazing. And it's one of those ones that it opens more, opens up more questions than it does, you know, answer them because it's a subject that is still in many ways, new territory to discuss. People have discussed the, the, the timings of the, of the famous Dan Busters raised raid in numerous books, but the, uh, the effects on the men who flew those kind of raids, the effects on the men who, who climbed into those Halifaxes. And, and I had said Halifaxes simply because Jane is in the sidebar. Then if I said Lancaster, she, she'd jump on me. Um, so, yeah, lots of questions to kind of bring things up. Um, yeah, there we are. I've got, I've got my copy of my stuff. No, about Hal oh, wrong way. Halifaxes, highly recommend. I'm sure everyone's already read it. Yeah. Right, so we'll, we'll plow for you a few questions. So, and some of them I will, I will, I will read, but then I will add a little bit of extra dimension. So, Ian said very early on, did the RAF conceal from crews the comparable losses of aircraft, or were they well aware? But so I'm going to add to that: was there any attempt to kind of mask dangers of particular commands or missions, or play things down, or be honest about it? You know, we we know the language is very careful isn't it they they don't talk about you know murdering civilians they'll talk about hitting the target within content but do you know if there's any kind of um scheme to to to, to slightly conceal the dangers of anything i don't know <laughs> it's the short answer to that question i have no idea i thought um, i thought a lot of these are gonna be questions that you'll just write them down later go i think damn more things to look up that one yeah i don't know um, 
I mean, you can, he could maybe formulate that you you know which aircraft you feel more comfortable in and, and you get back safely in and, and which aircraft return. But I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that there'd that, that, be that whole side second conversation about why people are drawn to the elite units where theoretically the, the losses are, are, are more, you're more likely to be killed. So are some people drawn to that because they think they're going to get through it quicker and out the other end? That's a, some people do, are, are they drawn to it because they feel they are, they are, they're going to survive. I mean, I, I always, it's an, it's not about bomber command, but there was an American airborne uh, pathfinder veteran I knew, um, uh, Bob Secrets from California very well. And he when he volunteered to be a pathfinder for Colonel Lilliman of the 501st, Lilliman stood up in front of all, there's that 200 guys there and said, you're going to be volunteering for a mission that two out of three of you will not be coming back from. So look mm -hmm. the men to your left, look the men to your right, and consider those odds that I've said there before you come up and sign this bit of paper. And Bob said to me with a smile, he said, I looked the guy to my left and I looked the guy to my right and I said, I'll miss those guys. That That is... His rationale at the time, and that was a joke he made 60, 70 years later, was it would never be him that was going to be. Mm. Um, yeah, the, they understood the losses, but they had managed to 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 come to terms. Robert Morgan, the pilot of the Memphis Bell, I've got his autobiography, which I was rereading the other day, that his crew used to gather and hold hands before they boarded the aircraft. It wasn't always the same crew every mission. That's the, the reality of Bomber Command and 8th Air Force. But the, whoever the crew was for that flight, they would they would stand in a circle and they would say, "If only one bomber comes back today, let's make sure it's ours." That and that's how they boarded the aircraft. So there's lots of um, mental trickery people mm. employ themselves to downplay the odds. And I would assume that's what most is mostly is going on. Myself, that, that everyone's just going into it with an attitude of their. Like you're convincing yourself you're going to win the lottery. I don't know. Yeah, you know the you you play the odds. You know why do people gamble? You play the odds. You always think you're going to win. You always think it's going to be the other guy who's going to die. I don't know. I mean, as as I think James said in the the sidebar, of course they knew. Um, you know, would I choose to go up in a Lank over to Germany? Would I prefer to be in a Mosquito? Probably. It's faster. But, you know, that, that eternal question, I think, yeah. there's been more conversations about since Masters of the Air. It's kind of prompted this, well, you know, there's this eternal comparison of, of the, the load that a mozzie could take compared to a B-17. Would you, Which one would you want to be in? Why didn't we just do loads of, you know, and you could spend an hour talking about that. But what would you prefer to be in? Something that's got a little bit more speed or something that's a bit bigger and better armoured? I prefer not to go at all. I prefer to let someone else do it, and then I can just talk about it from my comfy chair, sitting in my in my office. That's that's my coward's way out. Um, but hey, we'll go back to some questions. So, um, Ian is asking, what degree of latitude were squadron commanders given with brave air crew that they had reached the end of their tether to take them off op? So, to add to that, if you have well, you said you gave some example. If you've been there and done it, and you've been doing your tours, I mean, you've, you've logged the hours. Was there more tolerance for those people than there were the people at the beginning of their careers? Um, I think so. Certainly, as I said, I'm at the moment. I've been looking more at the strategic level of documents. So there's not a huge amount that's at the individual level, but what there is is when there've been individual medical officers. Um, station medical officers talking very sympathetically about you know Joe Bloggs has, has had enough and needs to be taken off duties because there's no question of cowardice there you know it's kind of he's exhausted he's done his bit and as I you know the the um, section I read from from Lord Moran you know you, people knew when people had done their bit yeah. um, and and I think on, a, on an individual level there was much more of of concern and just understanding that people needed a break, you know, whether that's send them to, to operational training units and whether teaching people to fly bombers is only less stressful than flying over Germany in them is an, is another matter. But, you know, that there were options for deploying people elsewhere and I just thought they needed a break. 
Um, okay, thank you. But equally, there's um, I'm thinking of of Guy Gibson and and his experiences. You know, we there's that um, very well known anecdote of him completely breaking down in the car with his girlfriend and kind of not being able to do you know not his wife his girlfriend um not being able to to do any more and yet being asked to do more so very subjective i think okay thank you um good one from dennis here um which is kind of tying into what dan was saying a couple of days ago about the 8th Air Force, Bomber Command, 15th Air Force, all experiencing and doing a very similar thing. Was there any co a cooperation or sharing of ideas between the RAF and the US Army Air Force's central medical establishment? Um, I'm going to hope um, the answer is yes. The answer's kind of no. Oh, damn. <laughs> they had a little bit, but and they would share information and they'd have visits, and so-and-so's visiting um, the committee today to talk about the work they're doing. And then they'd go... And then the minutes, and these are official minutes, would just then have really snarky comments about how the Americans are just really mm. woolly. And um, because the Americans had, um, I'm not sure at what stage it was published, but the US AAF, oh, it's, it's easy to say US Army Air Force than it is to say US AAF, yeah. um, had kind of a leaflet that explained their equivalent of flying stress. And they had kind of a rest home in, in Florida. So post-war, they started to share their learning. They weren't sharing too much during the war, but they did share a little bit after the war, immediately post-war. And there's all this sniffiness about, well, the incidence rates for the Americans, they reported higher rates of crews reporting flying stress and taking time out of operational duties. Um, we know, um, again, flat houses, um, were the American Red Cross um, option of, of giving crews being taken out of operational duties, giving them a bit of a break and a rest. And as, a, as I said, they had this unit in Florida, this sort of, not sure if it's a hospital as such, but a, a larger rest home. Um, and so flying stress was a recognized thing um, in the US Army Air Force. And so what was reported when they were comparing notes post-war, the Americans were saying, well, these are our incidence rates. And the RAF were saying, well, these are our incidence rates and they're much lower. Therefore, you've just mollycoddled yours. And it's, well, we're not saying the incidence rates were high. We're saying the reporting was higher. Right. And there's yep. a distinction. So it may be that crews were treated equally sympathetically, but it wasn't reported, wasn't necessarily captured in statistics for the RAF, whereas the Americans were. So there was a huge sniffiness and we were really snobby about the whole thing and said they were doing it wrong. Brilliant answer. That was, that was good. Um, Andreas is asking, were the crews given extra alcohol to numb their minds? So just to kind of uh, add my thought, when we had Alicia Callahan on a few weeks ago talking about the 6th Armour Division, American 6th Armour Division, her research said that they were administering alcohol in the training very early on to, 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 as, a, as a standard way of just re relieving stuff. But that's it's different when you're putting people in in multi-million pound machines at high altitude. So do you is there a simple response to that? Um simple response is again, I don't know. Um I know we gave and this is purely anecdotal. We've got another n equals one um anecdotal ex example, but a previous um neighbor of mine, his father was in Wellingtons and they were given amphetamines. We know the Luftwaffe gave their crews amphetamines. We did the same, night bomb, you need to keep awake. Um, he saved them up to take them for nights out. So when he did have a weekend pass, um, he just took loads of amphetamines so he could have a better time. Um, whether they get, also gave people more alcohol, I, I think you're right, Woody. I don't think you'd want pissed people. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't want a pissed navigator, would you? Oh, you're muted, Woody. I certainly don't think they were discouraged from going to the pub in their downtime. No, no one was yeah. definitely downtime. saying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't. Well, I don't know. I mean, I I can't imagine them kind of searching people for hip flasks flasks before joining. I don't know. It's it's again, it's interesting. And and whether there's anything as as policies, whether there were things happening on an individual basis in the crew, I don't know. Different. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Though. Thank you for the question, Andreas. It's interesting. Um, 
Um, what? Let's do another one. Uh, ground crews. Ian Carr brought up the point about ground crews being affected when their aircraft did not come back. And you said that in the case of Bomber Command, it was that the studies you're looking at are mostly about improving that efficiency of the operational side of things. Well, with ground crews, I suppose if you can just keep shouting at them until, and if they don't do their job, you punish them. So I'm going to guess, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there was nothing in the way of mental support for ground crews. I don't think so. But the, I mean, Ian's right that it is recognised that if there's a sense of powerlessness, so yeah. if the reports come back that, you know, aircraft such and such, you know, lost its engines and went down, the ground crew are going to hear that um, after the debrief. They're going to know that that happened. They're going to know that that aircraft um, went down because of engine failure. They're going to question then, were they responsible? Was there something they didn't do? They should, could have done differently. Mm. Um, so there was an impact, that feeling of powerlessness. You do what you can with the aircraft. You send the aircraft off. If it doesn't come back, was it your fault? Um, so there was that, there is now that understanding. What I don't know so much is how much it was understood at the time or how ground crew was supported. Because if there's an emerging understanding that experiences um, of combat led to difficulties, well, they're not in combat. So unless your airfield's yeah. been bombed, what, what are you whinging about? Don't know. I remember having a conversation via email with Stuart Lee, the comedian, when he did the Spike Milligan show with me three years ago, because his granddad was RAF ground crew on Bomber Command and suffered terribly in the guilt for the aircraft didn't come back. And at the end of the war, I mean, like in March or April, they allowed on that particular base, and I'd love to know whether that was a, a deliberate policy to address a particular situation that was random, but they let some of the ground crew people take part in air crews to push leaflets out over Germany and places like that. So his granddad did get to do uh, a, a mission over Germany, albeit it was either leaflets or it was dropping food bundles. And he and he hated it and was terrified and came back and it kind of made it worse because then he felt even worse for the, <laughs> he kind of convinced himself it can't have been anything. Well, and I was just doing a leaflet raid. So, so yeah. and that and Stuart was saying that yeah that his granddad suffered from that guilt all the way through his life that he he did survive the war and young lots of young men who kept because he aged if you're a ground crew you might have started the war in thirty nine at nineteen by the end you're twenty five and so but you're the people whose aircraft you're you're patching up each day they're kind of eternally staying twenty one and twenty two in some yeah. ways and and you're surviving and then you're and and I wonder how many different crews that they some of these ground crews would have worked with I mean it would have been it have been dozens. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Dan's just said in the sidebar, one ground crew chap at Waddington lost 10 aircraft, always worried that it was his fault. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's another aspect to think about. I'm glad, you know, going back to Master Yeah, I'm glad they've got old Jude Law's son in there as a member of the ground crew, uh, you know, acknowledging the fact that they are part of the team and part of the, the situation. We've got a few more questions. Um, so uh, this is a possibly a big one. Rob Crane. Is there any evidence that men who had qualms about area bombing were regarded as suspect? This brings up the greater kind of thing is that theoretically the Americans are doing the precision, taking out military targets with, with high precision and taking, you know, and not hitting civilian areas. And the RAF were hitting civilian areas. Um, and that being known to the crews, um, if, if people started talking about policy or doctrine, would that have a, have a, a set of alarm bells? I don't know. Yeah, sure. I, I, I told you there'd be questions. There'd be lots of questions that would just get you thinking about things, you know. I... And I think my my rabbit holes are because I've focused on um, strategic, you know, this strategic level um, within the archives. What I haven't done is, um, you know, next time maybe um, is then look at um, the individual war diaries. And I think yeah. as, as you've seen the the example there, you know, incredibly powerful. And to what extent, especially with maybe the passage of time, and was there a difference between how they felt 30, 40 years later to how they felt at yeah. the time? Did the, the post hoc rationalization happen? Did it make it better or worse? So at the end of the day, what they were trying to do was end the war. Um, and you either end the war quickly or you end the war slowly, and whatever you're going to do, don't know. Yeah. Uh, one from my mate Colin, who's also uh, struck down with a cold. Are there any figures for how many men were downgraded for mental health issues at their initial medical uh, medicals and to, but then served in some other area? I mean, did the 
I'm assuming there are there is data somewhere. I think so. I've seen some, there's a huge amount of statistics. And to be honest, I'm not hugely interested in statistics. I haven't looked. Um, but yes, there were certainly processes for weeding people out and doing those assessments at the time, which, as I said, that, you know, we're not just talking about um, a wholly volunteer crew. We're talking about incidents of, of serious mental illness um, within the population as a whole and how you identify that. So there's something to do with the use of, this may have been the army, actually, I may be um, I'm trying to remember it's uh, but using sergeants at recruitment centres to undertake testing. Um, so don't go any further. So there's something about do we put resource into the recruitment centres or do we do it? Do we do it in basic training? So there was a discussion about um, is it a worthwhile use of resource to do that screening then? Um, and there, was, there were debates about whether that was was of use or not. OK, well, thanks. And, and my last question really to round things up is, is this something you feel you're going to be spending time on over the next few years or months? Because I'm thinking of all the secondary sources. I mean, how many books there are about RAF and 8th Air Force and 15th Air Force crews that must just have every now and then a little reference to Johnny's having a bit of a wobble and, and what Johnny's experience was in that book? Because none of us could possibly live long enough to read every book by every I mean, all the 8th Air Force ones that are being republished right now, for example, because of the master's interest. So mm -hmm. is it are you a bit, are you interested in people sending you, you know, scans of pages of references to people with mental health being or is it is it too big a project or what? what where are I, you? I mm, angel devil, angel devil. Yeah. I'm, I would absolutely be fascinated. And one of the things I would like to do if I didn't have to work for a living and didn't have a mortgage to pay um would be to to spend time actually going through those individual personal letters yeah. you know i, I just use yeah. that one example from the archive there'll be many many similar ones there and sitting in other you know we we mentioned um boxted airfield museum yeah. um got to get essex in there somewhere um even though it is nearly suffolk um and you know there's a nice bit of essex i always tell myself <laughs> It's a pretty bit. It's near Dedham, isn't it? It's around there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, so there are plenty of stuff in those little local museums where individual families have donated um, letters. So they aren't necessarily things that are going to be in the big archives or sitting in um, squadron diaries. You know, so in my happy place, I'm I'm writing a best-selling book because so many right. people are interested in this. Um, but if not, it just becomes a really boring hobby of mine. Well, I mean, it's, it's not a really boring hobby. And I think that's the, you know, taking it back to what you said right at the beginning is, is this, this weird situation that these crews were in where they were in the thick of it one minute and then they were back, you know, able to write in a quiet environment to their wife, to their girlfriend, or go to the pub. And, you know, you, know, you can only, only get so much of um, diaries from people out in the, with the 14th Army in Burma because just keeping paper from getting wet was, was you know, really, really difficult. But with these air crews, they were in an environment where they there was this downtime. So I'm assuming that there is potentially a huge resource out there. And Dan Ellen would know, of course, of what they've got at the, at the Bomber Command Archive. But that people were probably having conversations. They were putting things down in letters. They were mentioning things. And they're, 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 I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be a subject that if someone and you 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 start the work and it carries on with other people as well, there is going to be a lot of information out there. Maybe not going back to your your making your the point about we can't um make diagnoses 80 plus years later but we can use them to kind of create a build a pic, paint a picture i suppose absolutely and i think stuart uh, burber just said in in the sidebar scores of bomber command memoirs yeah. out there there are completely self published and otherwise um but what do people put in memoirs you know what do they want other people to read Whereas what people might put in personal letters that have been donated often after their deaths, you know, and equally people can, you know, it's in, I'm thinking of, of Jane Austen's family burning all her letters because they didn't mm. want her secrets getting to be known. So that there mm. is something about looking at what's published and looking at what's unpublished. But, it, but even with the secondary sources, there's probably going to be stuff you can read between the lines. I mean, I'm thinking that. And yeah, you know, John Johnny just disappeared for a couple of weeks in in April forty four, and then then he came back again. And you know, you you could probably think, well, where, where did Johnny go? Was Johnny sent to somewhere like the flat houses that were in episode yeah. six? Yeah, you know, that kind of 
I'm yeah. sure there is in I'm sure it was a subject that was addressed, even if it was addressed by not addressing it properly. It was addressed by kind of dismissing it or, or working around it. You know, and piece of cake that the novel from the 80s covered yeah. the mental health of the pilots in the Battle of Britain and beyond, didn't it? In a in a not really vividly explaining it kind of way, but it was showing that some of them were going off their rocker and some of them were, were getting obsessed about certain yeah. things. So, yeah, there's lots of lots of fuel to, for thought. And I think it's one of those conversations we've had that for all the people who love discussing the merits of the, the, the B-17G compared to the B-17F, whatever it would be, at the end of the day, it is all about human beings getting into these these terrifying right. objects and flying at terrible altitudes into uh, dangers that we can only imagine. And uh, the fact that any of them came back and were able to have any kind of normal life is a testament to human endurance. Absolutely. Well, brilliant. We'll leave it there, Mary. So, folks, um, I'm off till March 11th, and um, then it's on all Masters of the Air content coming when we come back. So, Mary, um, I'll look forward to seeing it. We have ways in July. Uh, and and um, thanks, everybody, for your fantastic questions. I will see you all again after the break. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Willie.